Right, good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock on Tuesday. That means it's time for our Tuesday, Tuesday weekly webinar. So good to see everybody. Um, hope you're hearing and seeing me okay. And if you're just joining us on YouTube uh, and you're not joining us live, uh, be sure to hit that subscribe, like, and notification button so that you get notified when we post new videos. Uh, we always appreciate your comments and appreciate your likes. So if you like the video, please hit that like um, button and uh, love to hear comments. And if you're a subscriber, you can ask questions during the broadcast. So um, feel free, feel free to ask questions. We're going to follow our normal format today. Uh, we're going to have about 15 minutes of Ed Slot updates. That is updates from the Ed Slot group. Uh, we're going to talk about IRA distribution issues. Um, we're going to talk about a little bit about um, uh, things that come across in the daily uh, slot mailbag, and they typically have a report. Then we're going to talk a bit about the markets, and I'm going to share some analyst reports, and I'll share my thoughts on those analyst reports. And then we're going to get into our topic, our, our financial 15 or our financial planning topic today is, is your IRA uh, uh, protected from creditors? So I actually want to try something here. Let's try a poll. And I'm going to, I have yes or no. Let me just see what people say. So let's see if that works. I've done polls before on uh, YouTube or excuse me, uh, Zoom, but I discovered last week when I was sitting here with Dave, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that, that you can do, um, uh, you can do polls. So that's kind of fun. So uh, good morning, everybody who said good morning, David, Doug, and uh, Dr. Paul, thank you. He said congrats on Ed Slot, David McKnight, uh, get together. Uh, let's talk about that. That was a great event, folks, and I appreciate everyone who was there. And I, um, I've heard, I've received a lot of great feedback from people. So um, love hearing that. You know, these, these events are pretty significant to put on um, from a time and effort standpoint. So it's nice to hear that it's appreciated. And we certainly had a full house. I guess we had about 150, it would be my guess, people, uh, maybe 100, and, I don't know. Um, but uh, all the food got eaten. Je Chef Joe does an amazing job, and the speakers were great. Ed's fantastic. David's um, wonderful as well. And um, they both come from, you know, they both had the same idea, but they come at it different ways, and that's always good. So I appreciate all of you that, um, that uh, came. And um, we'll figure, we'll think about something for next year or, or maybe the year after, but we'll, we'll keep it going. And if you didn't watch the broadcast of Dave and I here live in studio uh, last week, you, sh you should. I, I typically don't, I have somebody, uh, my son edits my videos um, because I don't like watching them. Um, but I watched the, the program with Dave and I, I really enjoyed it. I have to say, you know, and it, um, I think uh, I think Dave's comments are really good, and there's a couple that um, uh, that are worth reviewing. So spend some time watching that again if you've already watched it, or certainly listen to it or watch it if you haven't. Uh, I know Dave told me that he's broken that down to about four episodes for his podcast. He likes to reuse the conversations we have, and and boy, do I appreciate that. Um, so um, so nice job, Dave, and nice job everybody who uh, asked good questions and was involved. So uh, let's let's talk a little bit about a headline. So debt ceiling is the big headline right now, right? What's going to happen? We're just about a week away. Um, you know, it's it's very very challenging when you can't when you see our elected uh, leaders who can't get things done. But um, it's it's frustrating when it has to go to this um, this point in time every single time. It seems like, and but uh, I'm sure we'll have some resolution at some point. We have to. But uh, the debt ceiling is a is a big concern, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Inflation is there's a lot a lot of discussion about inflation and recession. Uh, folks are talking about recession. Is it going to happen? Is it not going to happen? What's it going to look like? Who's it going to affect? Uh, it affects everybody, um, and um, uh, so we'll keep an eye on more on that. And you know my feelings. If the economists are being honest, I think what they when they look back, they'll they'll say that we've been in a recession really since the pandemic hit. Uh, it's just been delayed um, from the impact that people are feeling because we had so much cash flow uh, funds from the federal government into our pockets, uh, either businesses or individuals, individually. So we've got a lot of inf uh, information coming out this week. Um, today, uh, we, we hear 
new home sales. So what's happening around the country with home sales? We hear from the Richmond uh, Fed. Um, tomorrow we get the Fed minutes. Um, so that's the, the official report from the uh, Federal Reserve. Um, on Thursday, we have some pending home sales. We get the uh, Kansas City Fed weekly jobless claims. It's a big week. Uh, first quarter um, domestic product. Um, and then Friday, we have the PCE inflation reports. And I, I, I'm going to drill down a little bit about that. So um, the, the PCE is a, me is a measure of inflation. And some people say that uh, it's a more accurate measure of inflation. But I, I wanted to look up uh, and share with you what is this PCE report that we hear about. So I'm just going to read this to you. This is from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. Um, uh, the PCE report is a measure of the prices that people living in the United States or those buying on their behalf pay for goods and services. The PCE price index is known for capturing inflation or deflation across a wide range of consumer expenses and reflecting changes in consumer behavior. So um, it's it's different than the consumer price index we hear about, and it's different than the the producer price index, but it it should uh, track similarly. Uh, it, but it is different information. So then I went on a little bit further, and I dug in, and from Y charts, um, there is a question: What is the current PCE inflation rate? In inflation rate, and. Uh, that's current until we get the new information, right? The U.S. PCE inflation rate is 4.20 compared to 3.70 last quarter and 7.5% last year. This is higher than the long-term average of 3.14. The U.S. PCE inflation rate is the percentage in which a chosen basket of goods and services purchased in the U.S. Incre increases in price over a year. Uh, and uh, we know that, let me find the April... CPI number. Oh, how about that? I thought I had that here. Um, somebody can tell me what March I had at five percent. Somebody can tell me, Doctor Paul, tell me please what the uh, April number was. Okay, so uh, let's jump into our Ed Slot updates. I'm going to share my screen with you here. Let's just close that out. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you here. So give me a second. Okay, so you should be seeing my screen here. And back in the Zoom days, I'd say, raise your hand if you can see my screen. I missed that. But uh, I can see what you're seeing, and I'm, I'm, I'm becoming better at not closing it off here. But uh, this is from Ian Berger. You can see Ian here. Ian Berger is one of the analysts at the Slot Group. He does a great job, as they all do. And the topic here is a better way of understanding the once-per-year rollover rule. So this is, I guess, about a decade old now, but um, there is a court decision. Um, and I just, I, I know I covered the headline. I'll leave that there. Um, there's a court decision that said, uh, someone had rolled over a, done a 60 day rollover with an IRA. So they took a distribution from, from their IRA and they said, okay, I'm going to hold on to this and I'm going to decide what to do with it. Some people have used it in the past for loans, for housing purchases, car purchases, things like that. And they'll, they'll say, you know, it's, a, um, an interest free loan, things like that, or a short term loan. So it, it used to be a tactic that some people had. It always it always concerned me because if you miss that 60 day period by a day, you 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 can be really uh, stuck there. Um, and Walter just thank you, Walter. Walter just told us that the CPI for April was uh, 0 0.4, uh, 4.8 percent annualized. Great, thank you, sir. Um, boy, I've got a smart audience. Um, so anyway, so the once a year per, per rollover, was, let's, let's go back to 60 day rollovers. Um, so you could take a distribution out of an IRA or a retirement plan and you could um, really, these, this is IRA, um, an IRA and, um, and then hold it in, in your checking account or savings account for a period of time and then decide where you're going to put that. And if you put it into the IRA within 60 days, then there is no penalty or tax on that because you've rolled it over to an IRA. So it used to be a very, very common tactic, and and there were very limit, few limitations other than the fact that it has to make its way to an IRA by at the end of those sixty days. But then there was a court decision about a decade ago that said you can only do that once a year, once every twelve months, and that got very, very confusing. And and we've we've read, oh goodness, I meant to bring the manual in again, and I didn't, but. Um, We've read in case law after case law of people making the mistake of saying, I'm going to take distribution from my 
my IRA and I'm going to decide where, who I'm going to work with, where's, where it's going to go. And then I'm going to put it into the, the new IRA. And what happens is they, they might do two distributions. So let's make it extreme. They do a thousand dollar distribution today, uh, May 23rd, 2023. And then they, uh, 15 days later, they say, I'm going to, I'm going to take the remaining million dollars out of my IRA and I'm going to put that in the bank as well. And then I'm going to decide what to do with it. And then they, they say, okay, by the time that 60 days is over, I'm going to roll it into another IRA. And even if they're following the clock on the first 60 days, if they, if they choose that route, now they have two rollovers within a 12 month period. So the thousand dollars will roll over uh, if they're if they're within the 60 day window with no tax or penalty, but that million dollars is going to be subject to 100 percent tax and any penalty because it violates the once a year poor rollover rule. So I know it's confusing, but again, that's why you've got to work with experts in this area. So let me get into Ian's uh, Ian's uh, discussion here. Ian writes the once per year rollover rule is one of those IRA rules that has serious tax consequences. It cannot be fixed if violated. Breaking the rule results in a taxable distribution and a 10% early distribution penalty if you're under the age of 59 and a half. Plus, any rollover funds are considered excess IRA contributions that are subject to a 6% annual penalty unless timely corrected. It just gets worse and worse. <laughs> so the once per year rule applies to traditional IRA to I traditional IRA rollovers and Roth IRA to Roth IRA rollovers. It doesn't apply to company plan to IRA rollovers. That's why I corrected that statement I said earlier. Um, IRA to company plan rollovers or traditional IRA to Roth IRA rollovers, Roth conversions. One easy workaround to avoid the once per year rule is to do a direct transfer and still, instead of a 60-day rollover, folks, there's no reason not to do a direct transfer. Figure out where the money's going to go and have that check issued directly to that custodian. The rule is often explained by saying that you can't do more than one IRA to IRA or Roth IRA to Roth IRA rollover in any one year, 365 day period. That's an easy way of describing it, but it's not always accurate. A better explanation is to say you can't do a rollover an IRA distribution made with, within one year of a prior distribution that you rolled over. Here are a few examples to explain the rule. So uh, here's example one. Matea received a traditional IRA distribution on June 1st, 2022, that she rolled over to another traditional IRA on July 1st, 2022. If Matea receives a second traditional IRA or Roth IRA any time before June 1st, 2023, the once per year rule prevents her from doing another 60-day rollover of that second distribution to another like IRA. Example number two, let's say Mateo receives a second distribution on May 15th, 2023, within one year of the first distribution on June 1st, 2022. She would still violate the once per year rule, even if she delays rolling over the second distribution until July 2nd, 2023, more than one year after the first rollover on July 1st, 2022. So you've got to be really careful. It does stretch out over the year. Example number three, let me just... And see if I can wrap that up. Example number three. Now assume that Mateo, Matea receives the second distribution on June 10th, 2023, more than one year after the first distribution on June 1st, 2022. She would not violate the once per year roll every once per year rule, even if she rolls over the second distribution on June 15th, 2023, within one year of the first rollover on June, excuse me, July 1st, 2022. You see why I have you follow along? So if you're just listening to me on YouTube, you might want to pull up the channel and read this along with us. Uh, this is an example of when doing two rollovers within one year period on July 1st, 2022 and July 15th, excuse me, and June 15th, 2023 is perfectly acceptable. Um the bottom line is that in applying the once per year rule, you look to the timing of distributions being rolled over, not the timing of the rollovers. The, that's, this is a really great point and a really great way to simplify this. So the timing of the distributions, when it comes out of the account, not the timing of the rollovers. The rule prevents you from doing more than one rollover of distributions made with, within a one-year period. It does not necessarily prevent you from doing more than one rollover within a one year period. Great point. So I hope that um, that gives you some clarity on that rule, but I hope it also drives home that these, these issues are complex and for most people, they need guidance on this.
All right, so let's go into the slot report mailbag. This is a fun one from our friend Sarah Brenner. So Sarah writes, uh, hello, and thank you for all the great helpful information you continue to send out. I am due to take my first required minimum distribution in 2024. Always questions about required minimum distributions. So she's due to take the, uh, her first RMD in 2024, which would make my required beginning date April 1st of 2025. If I understand correctly, my intention is to empty my traditional IRA next year and convert it to my existing Roth. Um, my question is, if my traditional IRA shows zero balance by my required beginning date, would that still require an RMD to be taken in 2024? I'd like to know if I can convert the entire account or if I have to take an RMD and then convert the rest. So I think you all know the answer to that by now. Her question is, can I convert the entire amount or must I take that RMD first and uh, and then convert what's, re what's left? I think the answer is I would have to take an RMD, but I'm not 100% sure. Her name is Dana. So Sarah writes, hi, Dana, your thinking is correct. You must take an RMD for 2024 before you can convert. Remember, RMD funds cannot be converted and the IRS deems that the first funds out of the account are RMD distributions. Uh, I see people get stuck with that all the time, so be careful. The rules say that the first money out of your IRA in a year for which you must take an RMD is considered your RMD. An RMD cannot be converted. This is true even for the first RMD year when a conversion is done before your required beginning date. Great question. So here's another good one. Do I need to take an RMD, required minimum distribution, from my Roth 401k? Thanks. No name. The answer is, while you do not have to take RMDs during your lifetime from a Roth IRA, the rules have always required you to take RMDs from your Roth 401k. You might remember that. This remains true for 2023. However, beginning in 2024, Secure Act 2.0 does away with that requirement. So um, that is a change, but again, it doesn't take place until 2024. Starting next year, you will need to take RMDs. You will not, excuse me, starting next year, you will not need to take RMDs during your lifetime from your Roth 401k. So that's a correction. That's a very good correction. Um, it's always been a little bit frustrating that um, someone has to take distributions from uh, a Roth 401k and not a Roth IRA. There are sometimes, sometimes it makes sense to keep your, your money in your company plan. But you've got to determine that, you know, you've got to look at the pros and cons of each to see if it makes sense to keep funds in a retire in a company plan or to uh, roll them over to an IRA. And there's lots of considerations there. OK. Uh, let's talk about the markets. So last week, the markets were up slightly across the board. Um, well, I, I guess it depends on what you're looking at. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is up about a half a percent. The, the S&P 500 was up 1.71%. The NASDAQ crushed it last week. They're up, it was up 3%. So the year to date numbers for the NASDAQ is, uh, and this is as ending as of May 19th. So this was last Friday. Um, the NASDAQ is up 21.38% so far this year. Uh, the S&P 500 is up 9.90 and the Dow Jones Industrial Average is up just 1.69. So th this is um, a really good look at why just broad diversification and asset allocation is important because uh, if you just invested in the S&P 500, you know, you've got a good return so far this year. Let's just forget about what happened last year. We're just focusing on year to date right now. But um uh, but if you didn't include the NASDAQ, which is a, a whole other area of investment, uh, then uh, you would have missed out on that portion of your investments increasing by 21.38%. And if you just said, like some people said, well, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the SP 500 are really similar and they have similar components, but uh, you would be up just 1.69%. So, um, that's that's important. And and global indices are, are up as well. So the MSCI World Index, and not including the U.S., is up 11.22% for the year. And the Europe, Asia, and the Far East Index is up 11.77%. So this is a really good example of why you want broad diversification. And I'll share this with you. Let's um, let's share that what I'm looking at here. So this is the, the chart I get every week from Invesco. And you can see what I'm talking about. These are the different indices right here, and these are their returns for the year, week, year-to-date, and one-year period. 
And then um, let's move down here to fixed income. It says bonds. When you see fixed income, that reads as bonds. And when you see equities, remember that's stocks. Uh, the U.S. aggregate bond index is where most people have their bonds. It was down last week, 1.37%, but it's up slightly for the year so far. Remember, this is the area that really hurt so many people last year in 2022 because it was down significantly and people weren't expecting that. They expect these stock, uh, the stock markets, the stock indices to be down in difficult times. But but they've been told over the years that, hey, bonds zig when the others, when the stock market zags. And we had two zags last year and that's not uncommon. It also wasn't unforeseen. So um, uh, it's really important to uh, to understand how the markets work. And while we're on this page, we can look at the Fed funds target rate. Didn't increase over the week, but it certainly has increased from a year ago, right? We're at 5.25 right now. You can kind of see that, but it was 1% last year. So let me just uh, let me just clear this a little bit so we can see now the treasury. So the six month uh, U.S. treasury now is at 5.29%, where it was just 1.47% a year ago. And you can see that the uh, 10 year treasury is actually less. 3.67 compared to 2.84. So this is an example of that inverted yield curve. And you can see it up here on the right-hand side where the treasury yields, so the treasury bonds, bonds issued by the U.S. government, you get more, more uh, higher percentage yield for owning them in the short term than you do in the long term. And that's what people talk about, an inverted yield curve. So uh, just some real kind of basic information for you. So now with the time we have left here, in this section, let's talk about what the analysts are saying. So Cornerstone is our partner, and uh, uh, it's a, I shared with you that it's a group that we brought on back in December, I guess, who um, they help us research and develop and uh, implement our portfolios. It's been a very, very good partnership. And uh, Thomas, uh, the owner of the company, was actually at the slot event um, last week, and uh, many of you got to meet him. And uh, he's a very, very bright individual and with really great um, work ethic and strong um Strong desire to help clients, which is the most important. Uh, I haven't forgotten about this um, this poll. We'll come back to it before the before we go into the, our topic. Hopefully, if I remember. Um. So Cornerstone was talking. Uh, they gave me a re recap of the of what happened with the stocks, but um, um, they just uh, they ended up saying the consumer is slowing, but stocks remain resilient. So people are starting to buy less. You, you're starting to see. Um, and they have a neutral outlook regarding asset allocation. So they're not taking a weighting one way or the other. They did talk about the um, the um, leading index, uh, economic index. Uh, that fell 0.6% for April. Marking the I'm just reading their words. Marking the 13th straight month of declines. Eight out of the 10 components of the index were down or unchanged for the month. And they said, uh, they refer to a chart. And I, I, I can share that chart with you as well. Let's just do this um, so that you can see here. There's different times when you see these drops and they're saying that uh, it must be noted. I'm um, just let me highlight this. Uh, that's not going to work. It must be noted that the uh, uh, the leading economic index right here doesn't predict timing of the severity or potential or upcoming recession. But they're saying that um, uh, it seems important in that direction. You can see different times. So this is 2008, 2009. This, of course, is the pandemic. And this is where we are today. And you can look at other times. Here's 2001, 1991. So it's not hard to count, uh, you know, kind of where we had some troubling times uh, historically. Hope that makes sense. Okay. Wall Street Journal talked about President Biden and the debt ceiling. And it was an interesting article. They talked, they said, um, there's there's really no good result for politically for um, the White House. Uh, so that's always the problem, right? They they have to balance this political animal with what's great for the country and um, or what's what's good for the country. And, you know, going back to what Dave said last week, I've heard him say it a million times, but it really struck home. Um, you know, when we start talking about increasing taxes and where taxes have to get, and we believe taxes have to be 40 to 45 percent effective tax rate for most middle class Americans or for middle class Americans by 2030. And Dave said, what are you going to get for that? It's not like in Denmark or Iceland where you get, you know, um, universal health care and all these great social programs. What we're going to get is we're just going to be paying 
interest on the national debt and our basic Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid. Um, we're not going to get all these, you know, great benefits. We're just going to be able to pay the bills. And that's uh, with uh, greatly increasing taxes. So that's a little depressing, but um, but it's it's true. We have to get there. BlackRock is saying, I uh, had a discussion about public or private. Um, so publicly traded companies or private companies, which are they focusing on? And they're saying right now we prefer um, – private credit long-term. So credit is a bonds, right? It's debt to a company. Private credit long-term on better return potential. It's the mirror image in equities, equities or stocks. We prefer public stocks as risks fade in the median term. So they're saying the risks, uh, in their opinion, are going to uh, ease in the mid mid midterm, excuse me. Um, but I agree with them, by the way. So we've been, we've been implementing private debt for many years. It's been over a decade, but certainly, um, on, in our portfolios as a whole, we have two issues in particular that are, um, that are business development companies that issue that, that issue private debt. And they've been, they've performed very, very well, certainly, uh, since 2020, but, uh, even over the past decade. So um, BlackRock's catching up. That's good. Um, one of my favorite analysts now is uh, this, the, 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 um, the empower group. This breaks up into two. Let me see if I can just read it. I'm again, I'm just going to read this to you for, um, from where I sit. They write, there is at least three big unknowns. There are at least three big unknowns currently uh, preventing investors from making up their minds about much of anything. Right now, first, the debt ceiling. We spoke about that. Treasury Secretary Janet Yelling has been using extraordinary measures to pay the country's bills since mid-January as her department's ability to borrow remains in legislative limbo. Without a resolution soon, the country could technically default on its debt as soon as June 1st. It's really close, folks. Something that everyone agrees would be bad, but nobody really knows how bad. Second is the Fed on pause or not. Chairman Powell seemed to be to strongly suggest they might be when he announced the Fed's latest quarter point increase at the beginning of May, but an idea that a few other Fed officials seem to throw a little cold water on since then. And third, there's still the are we or are we not headed for a recession? Question lingering in the background. So that, that sums it up really well. These are the three things that are hanging on people's minds. Uh, they kind of wrap up with, as for the recession, well, that seems to be pretty much of a done deal, at least if you believe most economists. And last week's published data didn't do a whole lot to dispel that notion. Despite having spent pretty much all of their COVID area windfall, Americas are still spending. Retail sales advanced 0.4% in April, the first month ever, uh, excuse me, the first month over month gain since a big splurgy blowout in January. They, they rate very um, casually and kind of tongue in cheek in this, uh, these analyst reports. Um, and all but one of the high profile retailers who reported quarterly earnings last week beat estimates pretty comfortably, but the retail sales figure itself was only about half as robust as expense uh, as expected. And post earnings commentary was almost universally cautious. Common themes expressed by retail, uh, executives during those calls included weaker sales as a quarter dragged on, as well as consumers increasing aversion to buying big expensive stuff that they really don't need. Two things that feel a lot closer to a recessionary mindset than not. Folks, I'm seeing a, one of my favorite things to do on, on Facebook. I am on Facebook is I follow groups and I follow um, certain product groups. Like I have a F-150 Lightning, which is an, a, an electric vehicle. And I follow this group and I've seen the prices go uh, significantly higher. And then and the demand, the demand was very, very high starting this time last year, if not before. I can't remember when they first started hitting the markets, but but now it's it's ebbing um, quite a bit, easing quite a bit. Um, and I'm hearing things. You know, somebody posted this morning. Geez, I'd like to I'd like to buy my truck that I ordered a year and a half ago, but now it's thirteen thousand dollars more than I expected. That's a lot. And interest rates, the Ford quoted interest rates that this person wrote about was ten and a half percent. So that knocks this person, first of all, they don't want to pay $13,000 over what they're planning. And they're going to pay a lot more than that if they're financing it at 10.5%. So this is that's a really small example of what consumers are seeing every day. And that'll start that'll start causing a waning in, uh, in spending for sure. 
Okay, um, so let's move on to our financial planning topic. I'll get there in a second. Oh, so let me just go back and reiterate. So how do you, you know, we've, we hear these different things from these different analysts and how they're allocating and what they should be allocating. And, and just remember kind of the, the core. You want to build your foundation so that you can handle this. Like I always use the analogy of the buildings in San Francisco. They can move. Uh, if there's an earthquake, but they're, they shouldn't, they shouldn't crumble. So you're going to, and there may be a little bit of damage, but it shouldn't be devastating. You want to build your portfolio the same way. You want to make sure, you, you know, you want to be optimistic, but you want to be defensively optimistic. So make sure that you're built to withstand these strong winds, shaking ground, whatever you want to call it. And you do that through proper asset allocation. I talked about that today and I showed you how different areas you should be allocated into different areas and the difference that it makes or can make principal protection. You want something that is principal protected. You want something that does not go below zero as part of your portfolio. Ernst and Young just did a great report about the benefits of um, insurance backed uh, platforms like fixed index annuities and life insurance for that reason. And it, it's a very, very good report. Um, and the last is account segmentation, making sure that your accounts are allocated and they're invested correctly for each segment of your life. You've got an amount set aside to fund your zero to three years, for example, your four to six years, your six plus years, your, your seven, your, uh, your nine to 13 years, nine to 13. And you progress it out like that. That's all very, very difficult work. I understand that the last part, especially, but um, that's the best way to set yourself up and handle these things. So you want to be defensively optimistic. You want to make sure you've got your asset allocation, your principal protection, and your account segmentation in order. And you should be able to withstand this. And you should be able to really uh, work without the worry and be able to have the growth that you need. Okay. So let's ask, oh, it looks like Walter has a question. So uh, he writes, 2024 changes notwithstanding. Is there any reason after parting with the company and over 59 and a half, not to move a 401k Roth to a standard Roth. There are a lot of reasons, Walter. Good question, though. So you've got to look at the costs. You've got to look at the costs that, that are going to be applied to the new Roth IRA compared to the Roth 401k. The difficulty is, is that even with uh, new newer regulations, and it seems to be uh, a forever rolling thing, um, it's still sometimes really hard to ident identify the fees of, uh, of a 401k. Uh, so, uh, it shouldn't be, but, uh, it can be challenging. And, and there are some, there are some questions that we ask every time for, of the, um, the administrators, right? The, the people who offer the 401ks, the vanguards and the fidelities of the world, um, and that, that we ask about the costs and sometimes they can answer them and sometimes they, they can't. And I'm talking about the representative on the other line, the other end of the line, but, uh, it, it makes it very, very challenging. So, um, the other is access, Walter. So you may you may be able to have access to um, investments in a tradition or excuse me in a Roth IRA that you don't in your Roth four hundred one k, and there might be um, management style, right? So you might want to hire a financial planner to help you with that um, Roth IRA who can't help you with the Roth four hundred one k. So there's there's just a few examples. I hope that's helpful, but you've got to look at both sides of it. Really, really great question. All right, let's go to our poll. So the, the question was, is your IRA creditor protected? 22% of you said yes. And 78% of you said no. Well, I applaud you, right? Because this all came about today uh, because of a discussion I had with somebody a week or so ago. So let me, uh, let me first bring up my whiteboard and uh, let me change our look here. All right. So, um, just like many things. So if you're just joining us, this is the financial 15. This is the last 15 minutes or so of the um, of the Tuesday weekly webinar, which is about a 45 minute or so broadcast where we talk about um, some IRA distribution updates from the Ed Slack group. Um, and we talk about some market updates and some analyst reports. And then we move on to the financial 15 here. So if you're just watching this portion or just um uh, just joining us now, be sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification button so that you are always up to date on what's uh, uh, on, on the videos that we're putting out. So um, this topic is, is your IRA protected from creditors? And as I was saying, this came about from a conversation I had with somebody and they said, well, nobody can touch my IRA, right? Well, uh, the question is maybe, uh, and it depends on uh, where the funds came from and it depends on where you live. 
So let me just clarify a couple of things. I'm going to read this. My goal is not to give you, uh, excuse me, my goal is to give you a general idea about creditor protection. Uh, this is not a definitive guide. You should certainly speak to a qualified attorney if you have specific questions. Uh, and we're going to talk a bit about the difference between bankruptcy and creditor protection, because that's a common misunderstanding that I hear from people. If you roll it, you know, and let me, I mean, let me just talk about this. If you roll, um, a 401k, a company plan, a retirement plan into an IRA, because it's a 401k, it has 100% federal bankruptcy protection, but it doesn't mean it has 100% creditor protection. And that's different. Of course, if you're, um, uh, if you're seeking bankruptcy protection, that's one thing, but it doesn't mean other people, if you don't go down the route of uh, bankruptcy, it doesn't mean that your funds can't be accessed. So I'm going to give uh, credit where credit is due, as I always do. I'm moving my tablet right now down. I hope it doesn't disconnect. I'm always a little concerned about that, but I'm moving it down so I can draw on this. But all this information comes from our manual. So um, in it's been a few weeks now, but it, last month I attended a, a three-day event down in um, – National Harbor with the uh, Ed Slack group. So Ed, Ed and his team put on um, a day and a half or so. Uh, I was down there a day earlier because I'm on, as I mentioned, Ed's board this year. Um, and um, uh, we had a meeting the day before, but um, about a, uh, it's about a day and a half or two days of um, tax law updates, case law updates, um, uh, IRA distribution updates that is a requirement to be involved in Ed's, um, be part of Ed's master lead advisor group or his lead advisor group generally. But there's a, there's a, uh, I swear I'm going to bring it in one day. It's on my, it's sitting on my conference table, not, you know, two rooms away here, but, um, uh, it's a book about this thick and you'll see all my different tags on there, but this material comes right from that training manual. And uh, it's it's provided by Shannon Evans. Shannon is, uh, you know, I, I always say I meet some of the smartest people in the world there. <laughs> Shannon's one of them. She is a very, very um, intelligent individual. So these are Shannon's notes I'm going to share with you. So um, hopefully you can see them okay. Let me make sure I'm not cutting anything off. Um, we're going to talk about federal protection, bankruptcy, and non-bankruptcy for ERISA plans, qualified plans. Um, that's for ERISA plans. That's qualified plans with at least one employee other than business owner or spouse who are planned participants. So just if you have a solo 401k, that may not apply to you. Um, SEP, how about SEP and simple IRAs and IRAs? SEP and simple IRAs, not ERISA. They don't fall under ERISA, but complete bankruptcy protection under bankruptcy code. Um, Non-bankruptcy protection based on state law. And we're going to go through this because you should know what the law is in your state. Remember, this isn't just about bankruptcy. You want to protect, you know, when you're doing any kind of planning like this, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a little tongue in cheek, but you want to protect yourself from creditors, predators, uh, predators, all right, in-laws and outlaws, all right? That's the idea. And um, you want to make sure that you at least have an understanding of what's at risk. And you, and if you're leaving money to your children and it's going to be IRA money, you got to also, um, if, if it makes sense, help protect them as well. But again, be aware of this, be aware of these things. I don't want anybody to think that a, hey, just because it's an IRA and I hear this in class and I heard it a week ago, well, my IRA is protected, right? Nobody can, nobody can get that. And I think that was the comment. So let's talk about it. So, um, IRAs have a, have a limit, the bankruptcy protection. One million five hundred uh, five hundred twelve thousand three hundred fifty dollars per IRA owner, not per IRA account. If the owner has multiple investment accounts, uh, it's indexed for inflation, so it goes up every year. Uh, Non-bankruptcy protection again is state based on state law. So bankruptcy protection for an IRA, if it doesn't come from a four hundred one k or another retirement plan, company retirement plan, it's it's limited to one million five hundred twelve thousand three hundred fifty dollars. However. Um, it, uh, that is just bankruptcy protection, not creditor protection that's driven by state law. And believe it or not, we're going to go through the States. Um, that, where did that come about? That came about from a uh, court decision. A judge said some time ago, 
that uh, it was closer to a million dollars that um, he didn't figure that anybody could um, amass more than I think it was about one million to two hundred thousand um, dollars given a reasonable growth and contributions of their working lifetime. So that's where it started. And it does index for inflation every year. So that's the limit on federal bankruptcy bankruptcy protection. It doesn't for IRAs that don't come from retirement plans. IRA owners, potential creditors, bankruptcy, federal and state, civil creators, judgments and charging orders, state statutes, case law control, child support and alimony, state laws control that. That's very important too. Qualifying for Medicaid um, and uh, SSI must spend down the IRA also. IRA beneficiaries, no federal protection. State statutes control that. So think about inherited IRAs, IRA money you're going to leave to your uh, children. This is why it's such a, uh, an important planning topic. Many, many people think, okay, I'm going to leave my kids my Roth IRA. It's tax-free. That's, that's good. But think about if you're, remember, in-laws and outlaws, right? Not just, it's not just creditors and predators, but also in-laws and outlaws. Think about that future son-in-law, daughter-in-law, somebody who might have access to those funds. Um, state protection depends on state where beneficiary resides. This is important. State protection depends on state where beneficiary resides, not the deceased owner's state of residence. So you might live in Florida where you have a 100% creditor protection you're going to see for all of your IRA accounts, um, but your uh, children live in Pennsylvania where there are some stipulations there, or there's may live in another, another state where there is no protection. Uh, so consider, if that's a concern of yours, you might want to consider an inherited IRA accumulation trust if properly drafted can offer protection even if particular state law does not. So if your kids live in a state that isn't covered or you live in a state where it isn't covered, this might make sense to name a trust as a beneficiary. All right, Walter, I'll come back to your question. All right, so now, again, I want to give Shannon. Shannon broke down. She's done this twice. So she broke down a really great chart of what we're talking about here, the types of accounts and how they're protected. And then she did a great chart of um, the different states. I had a long conversation with her about this uh, last month when we were talking about uh, when we were in Washington. She did a great job. So if you look at this, so these are these ERISA plans. So these are 401ks, profit sharing plans with at least one employee that is not an owner or spouse. 100% federal bankruptcy protection. Also, 100% federal creditor protection. And any funds that come from an ERISA plan that you roll over to your IRA are also that follows that protection. Um, defined benefit plan with at least one employer. So these are, think pension, right? Uh, with at least one employee other than uh, owner or spouse, federal, 100%. Uh, creditor protected, 100%. And these are the, the, the case law. Again, I'm not a lawyer. I'm just repeating Shannon's information. Simple uh, and SEP IRAs and other non-ERISA plans, federal, 100%. This depends on the state statutory uh, protection. Traditional IRA, you get that federal bankruptcy protection, but now the creditor protection depends on that. Same, these are contributory IRAs. Uh, federal is, again, 1512000 uh, The rest of it is covered by the state. Rollover IRA or Roth IRA funds, um, from an employer plan, bankruptcy protection, federal 100%, state by state creditor protection. You got to remember that. Now, not inherited IRAs. Look at the difference. An inherited IRA is 0% federal bankruptcy protection, state bankruptcy protection per state, and the creditor protection by state as well. I'm hoping you're understanding the difference between bankruptcy and creditor and then what drives it, federal or state. And we have a lot of references here. All right, now let's look at the states. So I'm going to do some examples, and then we're going to talk about some of the most common states of people we deal with. So here's Alaska. Alaska is a good one. 100% Alaska statute says inherited IRAs are included. So your IRAs and your, um, your inherited IRAs even are 100% protected against creditor and bankruptcy protection. Uh, I mentioned Florida, so let's go to Florida. Where did Florida go? These are alphabetical. Florida, 100%. Inherited IRAs included. So that's good. Let's go to Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, right here. 
100%. But not within one year, not including rollovers, contribution greater than $15,000 in any one year period or fraudulent conveyance. So this is an area where if you have a concern, you better get an attorney involved, right? Because that's a little confusing. We could break it down, but it's a little confusing, not including rollovers. So that's money that comes from ERISA plans, right? But um, not within one year of other um, contributions and whatnot. And uh, contribution greater than $15,000 in any one year period or fraudulent conveyance if you, if you did something incorrectly, um, meaning like intentionally incorrectly. So that's that's interesting. New Jersey is another state we have a lot of clients in. 100% state and 100% inherited IRAs may be protected by case law. There's a question there. So it's not like some of those other states where we go through and say, yes, 100% protected. So this is another area if you've got um, your kids or people who might be inheriting your IRAs, you got to talk to a lawyer about that if that's a concern of yours. And frankly, it always should be a concern because when you're talking about creditors, you're talking about, you know, divorce is a little different, but spousal actions for sure, car accidents, general accidents, uh, you know, if somebody slips and falls at your house, there's just things like that. So you just want to make sure that you're protected. Um, in bankruptcy, of course, you've got to look at that. It, there could be it could be business issues. You know, if you have a failed business or something like that. Um, look at Ohio. Ohio is limited to the extent reasonably necessary for support. Um, inherited IRAs can it, uh, include it. Excuse me, no exemption for SEP and simple IRAs. Uh, so it gets it gets complicated. If you want this information, um, I think that I can. I could, if you want, if you want specific state information, I can copy and paste it to you. Um, I'll see if I can get this on the website also when it's done, but then Shannon ranked them. So the best A plus states are Alaska, Alabama, Arizona, Florida, Idaho, New Jersey. Here's this may be protected. Uh, North Carolina, South Carolina, South Carolina is like New Jersey that way may be protected and Texas uh, B plus. Um, we've, we've got quite a few Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, District of Columbia, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Kentucky, Maryland, Mississippi, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Oregon, Rhode Island, and Washington. Grade C is limitations to protection, but generally protected. Georgia, Hawaii, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Michigan, Montana, New York, Pennsylvania, Tennessee. We only get a C. Isn't that a shame? I'm going to talk to our legislators about that. Tennessee, Utah, Vermont, West Virginia, and Wisconsin. And then the worst states. She, only, she doesn't go to F. She only goes to D. Arkansas, California, Maine, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, North, North Dakota, Ohio, South Dakota, um, Virginia, and Wyoming. I would say that if your kids or yourself are in these states, uh, you should have a discussion with uh, an attorney and a planner. And you know my feeling about the team, right? CFP, CPA, at least one attorney, all working for you. These are the kind of things that get uncovered. Do you have any issues around creditor protection? What happens if I leave my money to my kids and he lives in California and I live here in Pennsylvania? And God forbid, uh, he's got a uh, lawsuit against him. Is that money accessible? Uh, so it may make sense to, the, to put, uh, put the funds into a trust, but you want to have that discussion with a qualified attorney. So again, my goal here wasn't to give you all the legal direction, because I'm not a lawyer, about your protection of your IRAs. It's to raise awareness. And the question was, is my IRA protected against creditors? Well, the answer, as you can see, is, well, maybe. Uh, it depends on where you live. It depends on where the funds came from. So it's not always about having the exact answer right now. It's about knowing the questions to ask and where to get the information. I hope that makes sense. So um, you've got to, if, if your situation, um, if this concerns you at all in your situation, reach out to us, perhaps we can help you resolve it or find somebody who can, but it's something to be aware of. I'm really happy to hear, and this is a very smart audience. I'm happy to, I was happy to see that 70 some percent of you said it was actually 77% of you said, um, your IRA is not protected because way too many people believe that your IRA is 100% protected. Um, so I hope that was helpful. And I do have a question from Walter and Walter says, so if IRA under certain uh, circumstances, not protected, but social security is, 
Is this yet another reason to spend down IRA in order to delay Social Security to 70? That's a good point. It may be. It may be a good reason for you. It may be. It may not be a good reason for someone else. They might live. Their whole family might live in a in a hundred percent protected state like Alaska or Florida, and nobody has uh, intentions on leaving. And uh, or they just they don't have that concern. Or they say um, we're gonna. Uh, my concern isn't for myself, but it's for my kids, and we're gonna leave the um, we're gonna name benef- uh, the uh, beneficiary a trust. All right. So um, that is the program for today. I hope it was helpful. We talked about, we went through some really good slot updates. We talked about the markets and then we talked about, is your IRA creditor protected? Uh, There is no webinar next week. Next week follows Memorial Day. So please remember those who gave sacrifice for our country. Uh, And um, uh, there is no webinar on Tuesdays that follow market holidays. So that is a market holiday. So we'll see you the following week. We'll be in June and I'll be excited to see you all then. Uh, if you have any questions, if you'd like to schedule an appointment, you can reach out to admin or questions. Let's leave it at questions at adabrowealth.com. That's questions at adabrowealth.com. Please always uh, feel free to share this information with anybody you think would benefit. Uh, And if you haven't already, hit that subscribe, like, and notification button on YouTube. And otherwise, we'll see you next week.